the recording of Women Matters meeting of the 26th of April. And today we just want to chat a little bit and exchange whatever we want to exchange without a special topic. Last time we did the Zen of Seeing with uh, Martini. I don't know if she's coming today. I prepared the web page and I will publish it soon. So it was That's nice. Great, last fun. Yeah, so we first do the check-in and then we see where we end up. Do you want to start, Gertraud? You are unmuted. I have Monia too, whoever. Uh, well, I just note, took down uh, to listen others and to life from last time. So while listening to you, you come to life to me or something like this. So I wouldn't just call it chattering. <laughs> okay, I pass on to get going. Uh, Monia, I had the feeling that it, it's difficult to understand you. So yeah, I think maybe you, you talk. Yeah, it's better. You talk okay. again. Okay, so to listen others into life is what I took down last time for today's topic. And um, so while I listen to you, you come to life to me. You come become alive. Yeah, something like that. Okay, get out. Yeah, I I had some back pain that really took me off for almost a week, and um, so I'm I'm good and healthy again. <laughs> so I'm happy and happy to see all of you. Martini is not here yet. No. Um, yeah, and um, I've been very busy thinking of how to put our work in a concept that is pointed, <laughs> one pointed and, and clear and yeah. So that is my, my check-in for the day. And uh, I pass on to Christine. Hello everybody. Um, I don't have a lot to say. I've been, uh, it, it seems like everything's pretty much a repetition all the time, working weekends, trying to uh, do a few fun things, but mostly a lot of errands and things around the house to get done. Um, listening a little bit more to music. Um, I did start piano lessons um, again, so that is really fun. Uh, I have a new teacher. Um, my old teacher is only doing things by phone, not even video by phone. And I'm like, I don't think that's gonna work for me. That's <laughs> it's a little bit too bare bones. So I have another teacher and he's got a different, totally different approach. So I'll see where, uh, where that goes. We're not so much using any sheet music right now. We're, uh, mostly just doing uh, chords and rhythms and stuff like that. So that's kind of fun. And uh, yeah, things are blooming and uh, pretty. And I am well, and I will pass on to Hanali. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I'm well. Um, I'm excited. After this at seven o'clock European time, I'll be sharing a Secret garden experience. So it's to sense shift the new world into being. So I'm excited about that. And we will meet every Monday for the next till the end of May. And it's been quite a creative period. So and I'm very grateful to be here with all you ladies. I really loved the Zen of Seeing experience last time to be here with you. It was really wonderful. And I will pass to Beatrice. Hello. Um Let's see. <laughs> it's it's really springtime here, which is nice, but I think soon it's going to get warm and we're going to get into the summer that I don't like very much because um, it gets very hot and humid. Um, I am I had a performance uh, on Saturday, um, and uh, it was kind of bookending this this exhibition that I've been helping support. Um, I helped install it, and I wrote an article about it, and 
I performed at the opening and then this was a it's still open for five more days, but this was kind of a concluding performance and it was a 40 minute improvisation with two musicians and another dancer and um, it was a lot of fun and I haven't performed for that long in a very long time um, and to improvise for 40 minutes is quite <laughs> quite a task, um, but it was it was really kind of exhilarating and um, I'm starting and then, and then a lot of I got a lot of positive feedback and connected with a lot of people that performed. So right now I'm I'm definitely in a place where I'm I'm excited about the fact that I think I can actually be an artist in New York. And what is that going to look like and what projects will I take on? And of course I'm still doing other things on the side to, you know, make money to keep a roof over my head, but um like babysitting and administrative stuff, but um it's starting to feel like a real possibility. And I've been coming out of a, a chapter of uncertainty and not knowing really what's next. So it feels good to have had some positive reinforcement that I can actually do things in New York and get positive feedback from that and uh, meet other artists and other like-minded thinkers. So um, yeah, that's, that's my check-in. Um, I'll pass to uh, the other East Coast U.S. person, <laughs> Lucinda. Oh, well, sounds wonderful. Um, well, I'm just sorry a little late, but I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, and yes, it is fully spring. You know, that kind of, I never could understand. My mother had all these kind of rugs that were just kind of pea green and rusty red and I I get it it's not fall it's spring colors you know the trees haven't leafed yet and so it's all very uh quite lovely um here we've been here almost a month which in Connecticut which is unusual because uh we've spent so long in New Hampshire um but uh my father's passed a year ago on April 20th and um it seems that it, doing taxes for someone who is no longer here is more, much more complicated than, than uh, if you're here. So my husband has been going crazy, but we're, not, we're probably gonna go back tomorrow. Meanwhile, I have actually finished the, um, the book. It's in query form and I was late because I was trying to begin the whole business of compiling a list for querying. At the same time, I'm researching self-publishing, which is daunting, but it's, I think, likely the way that I will go. Um, we'll just see what happens. And uh, both my husband and I are fully vaccinated and we've had uh, a couple of groups of people to our house for dinner, which is just extraordinary after a year and a quarter of isolation. Um, so, and I too have gone back to playing piano, which is really interesting. It just kind of happened. So there's, there's a creativity that's in the air. Um, I'm not feeling pressured to move on to the next book, which I have just I have for three years. And so the pressure's dropping away and just, I'm just waiting to see what comes next. Um, so I, I guess that it's, it's, it's there's a waiting and seeing, but it is feeling like full of possibility rather than than uh, bars, you know. So, yeah. And I don't know who hasn't gone yet. Uh, Monia, have you? Yeah, uh, Victoria, are you there? Yes, I, Victoria? I, I'm here. I my picture looks better than I do. <laughs> I um, just passing to Victoria, but I just read an email from her about Bach. Oh, that was months ago. You're way behind. Okay, I'll have to catch everyone up. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, let's see, my main news is, um, is that I, I'm suffering from just blood curdling nightmares and um, they're getting worse every night. And last night was so bad that I woke myself up screaming. Um, literally. So I'm a little groggy this morning. Um, so that's kind of my 
there. <laughs> Everyone's totally stunned. Um, I, I guess I should be saying it's springtime and the birds are singing. Um, well, they are, but but it's yeah. I so I'm a little bit disoriented this morning because um, I I had such poor sleep and the sleep I had was um, worse than any horror film I can imagine. I don't even watch horror films. So um, apart from that, uh, yes. Who? Oh, Lucinda. Yes. Um, you're still orange. I mean, yellow. Does that mean you're still? Can people hear me? We can hear you. I think your computer might be delayed, but we can hear you. Oh, okay. Because the the yellow. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, let's see. What was I saying? Oh, yes, Lucinda. Thank you. Um, I didn't mean to be so rude. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I had my Bach lecture concerts. Um, the they they book ended like Beatrice said. Um, the in this case Bach's birthday, which was March thirty first, and also the, the birthday of my late husband and Beatrice's father. Um, and I always celebrate his birthday with a lecture or a concert or something appropriate. Um, and now I'm supposed to be working on Joseph Boyce, but I've been procrastinating um, because I'm trying to get my wits together <laughs> with all these nightmares. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a hard time and it's ironic because I'm, I'm in a very intensive sort of spiritual path right now to, um, to try to heal. And so I'm, I'm going to all kinds of retreats, Buddhist retreats and um, mystical contemplative Christian workshops and um, <laughs> it, just about everything under the sun um, and um, cutting edge psychology summits. And um, so, so I'm becoming a real expert. So if any of you have any questions about um, <laughs> spiritual the spiritual path healing or um anything otherwise please let me know um nothing's working for me quite yet but <laughs> maybe i can maybe i can uh, contribute to your healing um <laughs> which would make it all worthwhile so um yeah without further ado i yeah so i'm in a kind of interim i, I have to get started on voice pretty soon like today hopefully um because it's it's an immense uh, project um a friend of mine who's the she's actually the director um i've invited her to join one of our groups because she's she's from bremen originally um and she's a wonderful person but she's too busy to talk even to people in the real world i mean not the real world but Sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, but anyway, she just um, drew my attention to a, some site shift. I haven't even looked at it yet, so I don't remember which one it is. The entire issue for um, May, uh, which just came out, is devoted to Joseph Boyce, and it's like 100 pages. So um, a friend of mine um, scanned the whole thing because it's at her library, the Athenaeum, which is where I used to perform when I was live. and. Um, so that alone, and it's all in German. So, um, so keep me in your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> that's a lot of intense intellectual German I have. Maybe that's why I'm procrastinating. So um, anyway, sorry, that's probably my contribution for the next few weeks. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So to me, I'm sort of fine. I'm digging my way into the rabbit holes even deeper and get ever more insights in things which are happening or not happening. I don't have nightmares, strangely, because what I'm hearing is sort of a nightmare, but um, I can sleep quite well. I start in the garden and uh, plant plants and I'm sort of somehow really serene and grateful to be alive. And I was hearing uh, listening into being, and then I was hearing a lot about music. Should we talk about music and art as a, a tool of, of listening into being? Because in some way, art is also a listening, no? It's not only even if you paint or if you dance, it's, it's maybe not so much the ear, but it's physical listening, so. 
if you are okay with that, I would throw that into the round and invite you to say something about it. Well, I was particularly struck by the nightmares Victoria mentioned uh, and her being on a spiritual path like never before and now she has nightmares. So that's also quite fascinating. Maybe we could once in a while talk about dreams or what we know about dreams and yeah, that's maybe another topic. Actually, to pick up on that, um, I know that in homeopathy, one of the signs of healing is, you know, rashes and such coming to the, the surface of the skin. And that's the first thing that I thought of, uh, Victoria, was, was that it could be that these, I'm sorry that these nightmares are showing up, but wondering if it's kind of like a psychic rash that is, is showing that there's a, a deeper healing happening. But um, That's really amazing because I, I've had this r strange rash on the back of my back, at the back of my back, on my back, um, ever since my Bach concerts. Oh, Bach, back to Bach. Um, sorry, I'm <laughs> in a silly mood today. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of the nightmare mode. Um, and I was wondering why it is because it doesn't seem to have any cause and it doesn't go away either. It just, it just like the right hand side of my back, which is the one I use for my bow arm. I mean, not that that matters. It itches constantly. It's like, it, it's not a real, well, it's sort of a rash anyway, but that's, I think that's very prescient and maybe it is purging. That's what a friend of mine says, but it's pretty painful. Thank you, Lucinda. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I just, um, as far as, as music, I mean, it seems like that's, that's the theme. Um, and I just was very, I mean, having told my father a year ago that I was moving from music to writing and, you know, poor soul, he, um, <laughs> couldn't do anything about it because he was about to leave. Um, but there just came a day when I had to, our, our house is being, we were getting new windows and our, so the, everything in the living room is all covered with drapes. And I just had to undrape the piano a little bit and, and, and play. And, I, and uh, now I've, you know, sit down a couple times a day and uh, it's, it's like, talk about, it is a, a way to listen. I've discovered, I'm trying to actually find my own way back to music not listen to say, oh, I'm not good enough. Um, so I'm looking at a new Gershwin piece and an old one that I learned and trying to memorize them, you know, really internalize them as opposed to, to uh, because he's very hard to read because they're all sharps and flats. Um, but there's, there's a sense of kind of, oh, I can do this and it, I, I I don't have to, there's, there's not even thought to it actually. I'm, I'm very curious about it. It is simply, I seem to be showing up at a place that I need to be showing up and then doing other things. It's not as though I'm showing up in order to do or be anything. So there's something about that, allowing myself to listen to the sounds and be with the music that's very nice. I can't say more about that. I'll jump in for a second um, because the this 40 minute improvisation was exactly that listening into being. It was, um, so I was, one of the musicians was Matt Sullivan who, who plays the oboe and the English horn. And he's the one that I've been collaborating with now for a little while. and working with and so and performed with on on that opening and so we have a working relationship but the other musician I had never performed with or heard um Elliot Sharp he's a guitarist well he's many things but he played guitar for this um and the dancer the other dancer was also someone who I'd never worked with before 
And so we just start, you know, <laughs> we were already like in front of an audience when we first worked together, you know, and it was all about listening and observing and absorbing and, and transforming. And um, I was, you know, listening to what Matt and Elliot were creating in the soundscape and letting that translate into physical movement for me. Um, but also seeing if I, how my movement could then affect their sound. Um, you know, sometimes they were watching and sometimes they weren't. And I, I didn't exactly know when, what was happening, but but sometimes I try to try to, you know, push the boundary of what's happening musically with what I was doing. Um, and then, you know, with, with the other dancer, Maho, uh, it was, you know, it's kind of a visual, a visual listening um, to see what she was, what choices she was making and how I could respond or echo the choices she was making or, you know, interact with her towards, towards the, middle end of of our improvisation we did this whole we were kind of spiraling around each other um and yeah anyway it was it's a it was a very beautiful it was very meditative and 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 even though 40 minutes is a long time and i was definitely like exhausted at the end of it it didn't i wasn't really aware of the passage of time i was just in it it was kind of immersed in this experience and then it was finished um, so that's another way, another kind of form of meditation. It's a kind of a movement meditation or a hearing meditation that happened, um, happened to be a performance too, but <laughs> it felt very meditative to me. This is inspiring me to tell you about the experience I had with several groups when we did vocal uh improvisation first on meditation on the body and then filling the body with certain sounds and exploring sounds and then normally it goes into a toning i think it is the 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 word today but it's not for doing toning but for exploring the body and the mind with with the, with the sounds with the different sounds and then you can see it's going in several waves. And then there are moments when one person is maybe responding to somebody else in the group. And then there is a sort of a choir building itself. And then somebody else goes, goes away in their own way and so on. But what is really astonishing that almost always it stops by itself at a certain point it's really stop. That's like this. I don't know what it is. It is sensing into 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 the sound, sensing into what what we are doing, and that it is. That's also with orchestras. No, when when I see then they go in synchro. Is it synchronicity the right word? That the, you only also with some directors. You 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 see he's there, but you don't even have to look. But you feel you feel when it is. So that's really, really uh, amazing. And this is also a form of listening to know, to be exactly on the same wave. I don't know how to, to say that, how to name that. It's amazing. It's, it's also a meditation and like sort of a spiritual experience when it works out this way. You make me remember when one of the things I did really enjoy with my uh, piano students was a time when I was, we would start and duet together before we would do anything. And um, even the very littlest children and to write to the adults, you know, we would, it would take a while to kind of mesh a little bit. And then all of a sudden there was a coherence and it would go places, it would go different places. And that, but it would, what you're, what I'm remembering is it always did find a satisfying stopping place of its own. And the littlest to the oldest, we all knew that was it. That was the piece. 
Sunda, yeah, you really make me remind me of our last love hour in April, where we did some humming together. And there were young people with and older people. And some of them, they, need, they didn't know each other at all. So it was the first time they got together. But we didn't start. That was not the purpose of the coming together. But we, you know, we just, it, I just guided them into this humming space. And the same happened as well. And the, there was a young man from Germany. And I, I, he was so powerful. His voice was so powerful with the humming as well. And we all had our own ribbons initially. And suddenly we were all attuned into, in that coherence that you just spoke about as well. And it was just such an incredible sacred experience to have that together, especially with strangers, people who've never met before. And there was some sense of unity, although the, the toning of the voices in the humming was very different. And everybody afterwards were really astounded by the experience. It was almost at, as if we all forgot what happened before that, um, during the process before that. And we ended with that. So it was beautiful to then leave from that space. It is really powerful. I have a question okay. for um, Beatrice. I was um, making a playlist. Um, I'm hosting a friend's birthday party, just a few ladies getting together. And, uh, but my friend likes to dance. And she and I have gone out dancing a number of times. Um, so I'm making this playlist and my friend said she wanted, she mostly likes songs from the 1950s and 1960s. And for me, dancing, if I know the music, obviously it's easier to dance to. You know, the songs that I know the best are the easiest ones. But I was imagining, I'm trying to listen to the to these songs that aren't as familiar to me and try to imagine imagine dancing to them and whether I want to add them or not. Um, and I guess when I, I, Beatrice said that she obviously didn't know what music the, uh, um, the musicians were going to play because she hadn't danced with them before. So if you don't know the music, my question is, is does that make it harder to dance to it? Um, and how do you create that? Yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm just asking about that process if you don't know the music well. Yeah. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's more exciting. There's more kind of curiosity and kind of an adventure because you have no idea what's happening going to come next. I mean, I think in this in this instance it was very contemporary kind of abstract music and so almost atonal at points and very so it was kind of, you know, it was, it was more it's so, someone in the space called it interpretive dance which which has a kind of a bad connotation so I don't like using using that phrase but that was kind of more what was happening. Um so that's a little bit different when I'm also when I'm like social dancing to music that's maybe a little bit more popular that has a beat or a rhythm that's a little bit different. So I'll, I'll answer the question of both sides. Um, with kind of the more popular music, like in your playlist, for example, um, usually if it's a certain style of music, there's some things that you can predict about what it's going to do. If you know that style of music that you know it's going to, you know, do repeat, have a, you know, a verse and then there's going to be a chorus or there's going to be you know the rhythm's going to stay the same for a while but then there might be a bridge that's a little bit different or something like that so with that when i go social dancing for example or when i used to when there wasn't a pandemic um i the first thing i do is try to latch on to whatever the bass rhythm is and kind of what's what's the undercurrent of that and really connect to that and then once I feel like I'm really connected to that, then I can start listening to the other lines in the music, the, the vocalist or the saxophone player or the guitar or whatever else is the, whatever other things are happening. And then I'll make choices to follow that line and then switch over to a different one, you know, and, and kind of try to pick out pieces of it to listen to and respond to. Um, and it's kind of, it was the same too on, for the improvisation with Matt and Elliot 
even though it was a different style of music and there wasn't, I wasn't latching onto a baseline because there wasn't a baseline or a rhythm. Um, but I was choosing at moments to either listen to the guitar or the English horn oboe. Um, or sometimes the interaction of the two, or sometimes I would list, hear something that one of them had done. And then even if they were moving on, I would keep internally kind of dancing to that thing that they had done to be a little bit of a delay and then join in with whatever they've changed to do. So I don't know, I mean, it's kind of abstract, it's hard to explain. And I think it's it takes it takes practice of just really hearing the music and then seeing how you feel like, what, what does the music look like to you physically or feel like, and then just following that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my experience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're describing like listening into being when you're you're picking up certain aspects of a, of a song uh, of the music and, and then following that where it's gonna take you. And of course, rock and roll is kind of easy to find the beat. So <laughs> that's like why I like dancing to it because uh, it's right there. So it's fun. Thank you. Don't you, isn't it possible that music is, is movement? I mean, it, it goes from the time that you get the first beat to the time when there's the last beat and everything, I don't know, I just, I, whether it's Irish music or Ranky Tanky or Philip Glass or something else, I, I, I think there's an invitation in, in the, that music to me is movement in a certain way. I don't know. It's, it's uh, the body knows if the, bo the body can listen to music and maybe know, know yeah. as well. I wanted to say that uh, when you have, when you don't know the music which is coming, you are more forced to be in the present, in the very present, and really translate what you hear in this moment into a movement. And I think this is even more exciting than when you already know, ah, this is the beat, and then we do it all the time like this, because then you get lost somehow in, in something as well, where you listen to that in that moment, follow the line, it's only that. And every second you have to adapt in some way or translate. I think in more on about Monia translation from one language into the other, into, into movement, music into movement. Gertraud, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think when you look at little children, um, they naturally take that uh, music, whatever that is, uh, and, and move in a way, some may be more than others, but when my, um, he went to the, the, the recorder and just <laughs> could hardly uh, walk. And he put on the music and then he moved like an Indian temple dancer. I mean, it was like, he's a tough guy. I mean, he's like, rah, 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 rah. And, and then all of a sudden he was like, <laughs> and I think this is what music does to children when they don't, they don't think about it. And uh, so I love to, to see that. And then the music stops and he's a tough guy again. <laughs> so that, that's really nice. And I was reminded of um, when uh, Hanali talked, when I did my body therapy training, at the end we did some kind of a ritual to end it with, in the summer camp with 40 people or so. Then we started, to, no music, started to clap everybody started to clap somehow and within maybe five minutes or so there was a rhythm not everybody the same clapping but there was this rhythm in the whole in the whole group and i was really like astonished how that could happen yeah with 40 people and everybody just starting somewhere <laughs> Yeah.
Lucinda, you said music is movement, and there's also a whole school of thought in the dance world that that dance is music. <laughs> um, for the, the flip side, um, which you know, there's is a whole, especially in the postmodern era, but there was a whole movement of uh, detaching uh, dance from music, um, especially like especially like pulling away from ballet and more traditional things where the music and the dance were so in sync and so coordinated and, and everything. And what would it look like if you danced in silence? Um, and what is the inherent quality of that? And I think if you ever watch dance in silence, you can see even, I mean, whether you're watching a dance that's already in silence or if you like are watching a video that has music and you turn off the music and just watch the body, you'll see the rhythm and you'll see, you can almost make up, it may be not exactly what the music really is, but you'll make up something that is similar in rhythm and maybe tonality in your head just by watching the body responding. So um, I think that's fascinating too, that it's, I think, I think they're totally like <laughs> intertwined. In a sense, I mean, uh, our bodies are music. I mean, we have a drum, we have the breath, which is, you know, and uh, uh, we have, you know, so, so that, uh, yeah. And even if you, you watch d dance in silence, you know, there's the sound of the feet and their, the breath and the swish of the clothes or the hair or whatever. So, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it is one, one loveliness. Do you know Nada Brahma? Uh, it's, I think it's in, only in German. It's in the 80s. Uh, somebody in the, in the German um, radio station did um, many um, transmissions about Nada Brahma, the word is sound. And uh, it was partly that he brought into the Western music the Tibetan or um, the, the overtone singing and many other things, but it's really amazing. And the the planets have sound, you know, everything has sound, everything, stones, everything, you know, and your body parts have different sounds. And um, there was uh, Alfred Tomatis who has developed this. Um, it's now, uh, I think, known as uh, Mozart therapy or something. He has developed um, a healing method where he sees which um, frequencies has, have been omitted in the, in the child or even in the, body, in the belly still or later. And so he had a sort of uh, machine which was uh, using Mozart music, but cutting out the frequencies uh, which he needed to learn, he or she, whoever that was. And so they were, got a training to, to, to being able again to listen to these fre frequencies. And then at the end, when they were able, they could hear the whole Mozart music, you know? So, and it's amazing. Unfortunately, it didn't come through very much like many of these alternative um, insights. But the body sound, Lucinda, yeah. What is his name? Alfred Tomatis. I used it because I discovered in, in voice teaching the, um, the importance of the skeleton of the bones for, for, the, um, for the, um, the sound. And then later somebody gave me a book which was not yet translated in German, but it's in, in Italian, um, The Voice and the Ear, L'Oreille uh, La Voix. Uh, maybe it's still um, still around, but his main thing, I have it over there, the, the, the ear and the universe is something like this. Um, and he, for instance, now just to, to complete this, he did uh, had, um, his father was an opera uh, singer and he was a doctor. And mm -hmm. so he saw a lot of people of, of high grade uh, musicians and then he did exercises, not exercises, um, how do you say, study research mm -hmm. on them. For instance, when you close the right ear, 
So with the headphones, now he closed the right ear. So the best violinist without the right ear, they, they you know, they, they couldn't play it like, like that anymore, you know? Or somebody in another one, which really example, which uh, excited me, it was um, that there was a person who fluently spoke six languages and he put into his earphones only the frequencies of his own voice uh, so back into the, to the earphones, which excluded, uh, which was in certain ranges of frequencies. And so this person changed from German to Russian to French to something else. And he didn't, he wasn't even aware because every language has the certain preferred range of, of frequencies. So language is sound, but, you know, <laughs> to complete this, there is an old, enemy ship between England and France, no? And he found out that the France, uh, the French uh, language goes from zero hertz to 2000, the preferred mode, and the English starts at 2000 and goes higher. So that may even be that they just cannot really understand easily each other. And so <laughs> it's, it's fascinating, his work. I love Tomatis, and actually, the right ear is where the audit, the uh, auditory nerve is closest. The left ear, you have to go over around. You comes the sound comes in and around, and um, by that I used when I was teaching I had a choir, children's choirs. There, there were certain children, for instance, who were afraid that, that they might disappear, so they would sing like a full second or a third apart from the note they were supposed to sing so that they could hear themselves. I mean, they'd track the, the right notes, but just in parallel. But there was one child who didn't think he could, somebody he'd been told he couldn't sing. So I just, afterwards, I sang into his right ear. Every, I'd spent about 10 minutes per week with him and sang the note until he could sing the right pitch. And I've done it with my piano students as well. It's something, it's, it's like training that right ear. And that was from Tomatis, I, I'd forgotten that. Lovely. I had, <clears throat> sorry, I had a violin student back in the years when I was teaching in Australia um, who was deaf in her left ear, completely deaf but her right ear was okay. So, um, and she, I was able to teach her. And so what you're saying, Lucinda is definitely borne out by that because she wouldn't have been able to learn the violin of all instruments um, if she had been deaf, if it had been the other way around, I think. Um, I, I, when we lived in Vienna, we had, um, this was maybe the most exciting day of my life or one of them. Um, Yehudi Menuhin came to Vienna to play a concert and he it was shortly before his death. Uh, he didn't play, he, sorry, he conducted of course, because he didn't play anymore by that time. But the uh, British ambassador gave a luncheon party the next day um, at, his, at the British uh, residence. And um, my husband and I were invited and because we went to all those things. Anyway, I, I cornered him the minute I got into the space <laughs> and had a fabulous conversation, which I've never forgotten. And he said, it was so inspiring. He said that, um, that uh, singing is the, you know, is the most primordial um, gift that, that human beings have. And he really believed that um, singing preceded speech that vocalizing, some kind of um, vocalizing with tone preceded actual, what we know now as language. Um, and on that basis, he um, really dedicated his life. That's why he started, he told me that's why he started his school in England. Um, it wasn't for violinists, which is what I had thought, you know, growing up, of course. Um, he said it was actually um, to fight um, for the cause of everyone having the capacity to be a musician. And not necessarily, obviously, a professional musician like anything else. You have to have a gift. But he maintained to, till his dying day that there's no such thing as being tone deaf. And people who say they can't carry a tune are simply has simply not tapped into that primordial gift. So that he he absolutely asserted that um, every single person on the planet can sing. 
And he said the reason he started his school was to get children while they were still young, because um, in the olden days, of course, as all of you know, um, every school and every church and every community had children's choirs. I mean, children always sang. It's it's now that they can't carry a tune because they're not that 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 hasn't been brought forth. But it's not that they can't. So um, I just thought that was so wonderfully inspiring. And it makes so much sense because I think it is really foundational. Um, and I've, yeah, I've proven it many times because when I lived in um, Australia, I also was asked to be the conductor of an Italian um, Coro degli Alpini, which I'm, Heidi probably knows well about. Um, seems like there's one in every Italian town and village. Um, there were all these Italian men that, um, had come over after the Second World War um, because they their passage was sponsored by the Australian government. And they were bricklayers and masons and sausage makers. And you know, they were they were people from small villages and they wanted desperately to have a, a Coro degli Alpini. So it's an all-male chorus and it's a, a very traditional thing. And I had learned all those songs when I lived in Venice um, years before. So I became the conductor. And none of them could carry a tune. I mean, it was it was shocking. The first rehearsal was like was like being with a bunch of wild cats or something. And but amazingly, it was like what you said, Lucinda. Just like like I would just well, I had a piano, but I also would sing with them. But just slowly by slowly, you know, note by note, I got their ears into focus. And then they became quite good. They even sang for the you know officially for the Italian consul and stuff. And they were so proud, but it was amazing because they, at the beginning, I really despaired, but I thought back to that Yehudi Menuhin thing. And I thought, okay, there's some way this is going to work. And it did. Yeah, my teaching of singing was exactly based on this idea that everybody can sing. And if they are tone deaf, that's because they didn't have enough exercise. And I was so cross with the, uh, in the German school with the music teacher, where there were two or three tone deaf people in every class. And I say, said, send them. Now is the time. Now you can still get them. When they are adult and they say, oh, no, I cannot sing. And they will never sing, but they can when you get it in time, no? because it's also a developmental thing. As we know from integral theory, the desire to be in accordance with the surrounding in children uh, is not from the beginning. It is a certain stage in their development when they want to belong and then they adapt to the, to the others. No? And then would be the time to, uh, to, to fix this ability with them and they can. While before, you know, children, they sing because they want to sing and they don't care what the others sing. Not everybody logically, but that's not a defect of not being able to, but then they get said, oh, you be silent, you cannot sing. And then they bring it all over their life as I'm not able. And I had some good results with people by adult people was teaching them first to listen before they open the mouth. <laughs> listen into being. My, my sister had a music teacher who'd, who said uh, that she had a trout in, in her throat and uh, that stopped her <laughs> from ever singing again. That's a reminder. Um, I have, I just, yeah, there are things coming up um, from my body therapy training. And one of which was that we were placed, um, so in couples, <laughs> and then they, they, we were uh, listening to our heart and singing to the heart of the other person. So just making sounds, whatever. And, and so we were standing in front of each other and just first just listening and looking. And then, uh, and it was amazing what came out of those mouths. <laughs> like one more like opera and the other one more like whatever. Uh, it, was, it was so, the, the, the bandwidth, of, of expression, just just heart to heart connection 
that was really amazing. So looking at each other and singing to each other's heart was really, really one of the most amazing things that, that we did. I, I believe the same thing about movement. Um, when people say, oh, I have two left feet or, you know, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I don't buy it. it. I don't think it's true. And I think if you, I mean, if you look at children and babies and also if if you look at if people really, like if they put on their music that they like and nobody else is in the space, I bet you anything, there's something you're, you're gonna wanna move a little bit. And that's, I think everybody has movement in them. And in terms of learning maybe more formal coordination or or movement styles you know whatever it takes practice and if, it, if you start later in life it's going to take a little bit more time maybe especially if it's something that you've you know not been allowed to do all your life or have been judged for or thought that you couldn't do but I firmly believe I used to teach swing dancing when I lived in Santa Barbara and and often you know for two adults who maybe had never danced before and having to teach them the you know rudimentary steps and and of swing dancing and it's a hard process but it's possible and I think people get too much in their heads about it you know you, you it's and and honestly I think it's true for all creativity it's it's when you're a child you draw you sing you dance you know if, if you're just left to your own devices you can be tremendously creative with imagination and and all these different things, storytelling, moving, singing. And, and then as people tell you, oh, you're not good enough or, oh, that's not, you know, not something worthwhile pursuing or, you know, it's not gonna make money or whatever, <laughs> it gets shut down. But um, I was just reading this book. I mean, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. It's been around for a long time called The Artist's Way. And the whole premise of the book is that every single person has an inner artist. And like my mother was saying, you know, not necessarily you're going to be, become professional or the greatest artist of all time, but every single person has an inner childlike artist and ability to be creative. And it's just a matter of nurturing and protecting and get, creating a safe space for that creative self to emerge. So... Are you talking of Julia Cameron? Yes. Mm. I also think it's, there's a lot of importance of, of early childhood. Um, I taught at a, 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 a in the same church. Somehow I, I got to meet with children who, you know, who are, whose parents were in church, the Sunday school children. And I'd say they were probably, it was a class I'm thinking of where there may be six and seven year olds. And I started just with singing with them. And there were some children that just joined right in. And there were some children, you could tell the families who they were never sung to at home. They looked like I was vomiting on the rug. What is she doing? It's just the strangeness of it. And of course, you know, they could just what, as Heidi said, you know, be, be brought along finally. But um, I think of my husband who, I mean, I, I just, I, 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 I've always danced. So, so there's, to me, it's intuitively obvious, but he had no music. He's a fabulous singer, but he had no music in his household. And I know, for instance, we changed our kids' diapers, you know, and, and did yum, bum, 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 you know, with their legs and bounce them to, you know, William Tell and so our, both of our uh, both our children, you know, have rhythm in them. But my husband, he thinks it just what just as Beatrice said. He he's he's very involved in this head. And do I have it? And to, just to get him with the beat, I mean, conductors. He's a fabulous voice, but conductors really had to work very hard with him. Um, so there's something about grounding rhythm in the body that is easier for people if they have it early. But the fact is that we have it already in the belly of our mothers. The heartbeat is the ground beat of, of life. And I think if this happens, as you say, there has been some interference at a certain point of, of life, which has excluded 
yourself from the natural rhythm. Well, I can attest to the fact that um, I, Beatrice is is it, it has the greatest difficulty in um, keeping a normal schedule. She's a real night owl, as we say in English. Um, lately, she says she's been going to bed at one o'clock in the morning for no reason. I mean, she has no no uh, no reason to do that. But but I have th thought often thought back that when I was pregnant, I, I played concerts right up until um, her birth and um, and also attended concerts. So, um, you know, she was hearing music in the womb um, at late at night. And then of course I would sleep in in the morning because I was up so late at night. And so she was in that rhythm. And she, in, in, when I would be playing the concert, she'd be kicking so hard. Sometimes I could hardly, you know, she, that, that was its own rhythm <laughs> to be following, but it's, um, it's definitely, yeah, she, I know she was taking in all of that, you know, in the, in the womb. Maybe that's why she's a dancer. Yeah, I love it what you say, Victoria, because of my son, we danced till I was nine months pregnant. And he was a week old and we were already back on the dance floor. So with the carry cot next on the, in the, on the dance floor. And so he was used to that. So by the age of three, he already had his first set of drums. Um, and we, had, you know, we knew his love for music, playing the guitar and trying all sorts of things, flutes and all sorts of things was because of He's, while I was uh, while I was pregnant with him, that he was he's got incredible rhythm as well, and the beautiful part is where he played out when he was playing men's hockey. You could see it in his body that he was moving differently from his teammates playing hockey because of this inherent rhythm. Because we, I mean, he he was from he was conceived till he was born. We were dancing all the time, so. It's just fascinating how that impacts them in later in life, but in other ways as well. That's also in the books of Tomates. He is uh, collecting all these things. It, it went even so far that um, a person was very fascinated by, I think, what was it? Mala uh, was uh, something Mala of Brahms sung by Kathleen Ferrier. And um, so he was very uh, excited um, by the music. And so he gave it to his mother for, um, for her birthday or something. And she said, oh, that's exactly the music we heard every day when you were in my belly. And only with this, with Kathleen Ferrier, because he didn't like the same music with any other singer, only with this singer. So it seems to be really that uh, before we are born, music can play a very important role. It could be used no? also for singing quiet songs. So when the child's are born, I know it of, of a friend of mine, they did that. When the child was born, they just had to sing the song and the child was Maybe Victoria, we need to find the song you heard before you were born now to, <laughs> to sleep better. You're, you're make, making a, 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 an interesting in point. You know, my, neither of my children have gone on to be musicians. Um, although they grew up with, in, in with the womb and with me doing operas. And yet, um, I was speaking to our son who's 34 the other day and I was bemoaning a certain technology. And he said, well, you just have to, I, I often listen to uh, Die Zauberflöte, but you have to look for like Carl Böhm and you have to, so, so there's this man that I, I assumed, you know, would just had, and he did music through high school and that was it. But he's, he's, he, he's out there and kind of, listening to to you know really beautiful things so it can be surprising that just reminded me of oh sorry 
go ahead. Oh, no, that's just a quick thing. Um, that just reminded me, um, I had a flashback that when my mother was divorcing my father, I was only a year old and she apparently hired a German um, nanny to look after me and my sister. And I don't have any conscious memory at all of the woman or anything about it, but I do remember that I sang on stage with my um, sister. I was only three and we sang Ein Männlein steht im Wald ganz still und stumm. And, um, and, and some other German songs. I can't remember what other ones we sang. And it's, it just hit me now. I didn't even know that was a different language. I didn't know anything. She, obviously what this nanny taught us was just songs, but, um, but they're, in, they're still engraved in my memory. It's amazing. So it was uh, through music, obviously, because it was only later that I started learning German. And then I, I thought, this seems familiar somehow, this language, but it's interesting. I don't know if that if that's true, but I heard that uh, Japanese or Asian people, if they don't listen to Western uh, English, French, whatever, um, till the age of, I don't know, three or so, then it's very hard to get the R. Um, but when they listen to it, even on TV or whatever, then then they have that is familiar so that you can't so listening into speaking if you if you cannot or if you do not listen to a certain language you have hard time to to learn it afterwards even if you didn't speak it before just just the sound and what I was going to say is my youngest daughter, when she was, I was um, teaching in the midwife school. And so uh, I had my, and I was pregnant. And so I brought my daughter with, <laughs> and they were very happy to have her. And so she was in the, in the class. And so, and we did a, a belly dance lesson together with the students. Not teaching, I was part of that. And I brought her with me. So she was four weeks old or so. And, and I brought her with me and within five minutes, she went asleep, <laughs> even with loud music. And she was the one of the three who could, she, she didn't, um, when she started to, to walk, she was just sitting in the middle of the room, going up, and then down again, and then it was like uh, Qigong <laughs> ground <laughs> stand. And from there, she started to, to, to walk. So she had this balance in, in herself to, to, to go from stable standing and walking and not like most, peop most people go from the furniture or so to try to go to mommy or so she has a like a grace in herself. That's really amazing. So this, yeah. Interesting in conversation, I think. Yeah, it has also to do with the modes of, of learning, which we are strongly neglecting today in our education. We think it's all about words, all about uh, brain. <laughs> yeah, it's also singing is about brain, but in another way. So it would be good if we could be more integrating the other ways of learning. And before three, babies seem to, or young children seem to use much more the other ways of seeing, listening, copying, moving, all these things. And and combining it. Yeah, and it becomes so natural. Part of our exercises is to gain that back, isn't it? Yeah, ladies, it was a nice talk again. Let's do a short checkout round. Yeah, I start. I can only recommend Alfred Tomatis, 
to, to read his, his works, really, really interesting, not only for people who sing, but for, for everybody. And the other Nada Brahma, I have to figure out if this uh, is also translated, at least the book into, into English. The radio uh, broadcast things, probably not, because it's in German, but very, very good. Yeah, thanks for all your input. Very exciting, very inspiring. I give over to Bonya. I'm wondering, uh, do you think the frequencies uh, would enable us to hum together, Heidi? Or would that be just too interrupted? In Zoom? Uh, Here, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we will have a very good uh, experience, unfortunately. Okay. We have to wait until we meet again in person, again, okay. maybe okay. for the first time. We How could, did... I attended a, well, I performed in a concert that was all experimental um, interactive music things on Zoom. And the first piece they did was Pauline Oliveris's, uh, I don't know what the title is, toning, is that what it's called? Toning, I guess? <laughs> toning exercise? I don't know what it's called, but but it was people just humming or, or singing out uh, notes and listening for each other. And it was a weird disorienting experience because you would maybe only hear one or two people at a time, but um, voices did kind of emerge and dissipate as you will say. So it is, it is possible. It's not exactly the same experience, but um, it, it is possible on Zoom. It's just a little, little disjointed and maybe not something that you want to record and put out into the world, but definitely could be something we can ex try to experience. Okay, Patrice, thank you. Mm -hmm. I pass on to Hanneli, she's next to me on the screen. Thank you, Monia. Thank you, ladies. I love sound and we will sound a lot as well. And we did humming together and toning as well online on Zoom. Um, I love music. Um, I always said I was born to dance. And I think we can dance in different ways as well, not just formally performing that I did, but it's also that connection with the movement and singing as well and listening of all ourselves. So thank you for all your beautiful contributions here today. And I pass to Christine. Well, I found this conversation uh, really inspiring in terms of, you know, thoughts about creativity and ways of being and um, listening in particular. I, I know that's one of... Uh, well, I listen for a living, but when it comes to music, um, I am trying so hard to perform music that the listening part gets lost amazingly. I'm, I'm sure those of you who perform music understand what that means. But um, yeah, so it's it's been interesting to emphasize the listening part and the creativity. So uh, thank you, I'm, I'm inspired. And I will pass on to Gertrude. Thanks, Christine. I would end with the same sentence that Monia said at the beginning, listening into being. And I think that's like whole body listening. I don't know if we talked about the, the visceral listening. Yeah, that's that might be the right word. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. It's been a very nice conversation. I really, really liked it. And I pass on to Victoria. Um, well, of course, I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> um, I would love to. Uh, to explore it further. I think there's a lot that can be done. And um, I think Beatrice too, I, if I recall correctly, when we did our Caravan of Unity um, ritual, we also had a, a, some kind of, we tried to do some kind of humming exercise. Uh, no, maybe we, anyway. It was the breathing one. Oh, the breathing one, that's right. Um, so I think there is there there are possibilities that we could do, we could do a session with that. And, um, I just wanted to commend you, Christine, um, <laughs> in front of this August company for taking up piano lessons again. That's really great. 
and um, and keep persevering. And yes, that's the biggest challenge. Is um, it that it's definitely a a mind body um, challenge to learn to play an instrument. But um, but I encourage you to sometimes just like break away from that and just just listen, like just fool around on the keyboard, just to keep the like the somatic connection between the sound that you're producing and and um, but it, but it is really hard and um, that's actually one of the premises of the Suzuki method of um, of music learning for children is um, is to have it all by ear initially and they just learn to read music later um, but that's a whole other discourse for another time <laughs> um, so I will pass it on to Lucinda. Hmm, what a delicious conversation. I'm so grateful to be here with you. And um, I also feel that listening into being has to do with this quality. I feel this is a very dropped in, if you will. Um, people have dropped into their bodies to really listen to each other. And I, and I just, am, it's, it's, it's astonishing what's come out um, from everyone. It's, it's really been a, a symphony of, of of beauty, so I'm I'm really appreciative. So thank you. Pass it on to Beatrice. Thanks. Uh, yeah, this was fabulous, and I could talk about art and music and dance and <laughs> being meditative and present in the world from these perspectives all day long. Um, so thank you all, and uh, I hope that everybody. Here, my my encouragement to everybody, including myself, is. Um, before our next meeting, dance a little bit, sing a little bit, you know, if it's in your own living room or whatever, no one's around, but I think find that that creative spark and without judgment, I think it's it's really valuable and beautiful. And it's a reminder to me too, because I often am judging my own creative practice, you know, wanting to do it professionally, but it's also important to just do it for fun sometimes and not worry about what it looks like or, you know, how good it is, but just be authentic. So that's my encouragement to everybody. And I'll pass it to Heidi. Yeah, thank you. And I will leave you with the last recommendation. I don't know if you know her, uh, Evelyn Glenny, the the deaf, the deaf um, percussionist. She has a film, she has done a documentary about her, which is called Touch the Sound, full body listening, because she has learned music only by body, only by vibration. I saw it in a big theater uh, and I my perception was changed for a whole day. Now, when you see it on a little screen, maybe it's not as, imp as impressive, but it's still impressive. You can find it also on YouTube. What's her Very, name? Evelyn Glenny. And um, she, uh, she has performed in the biggest concert halls. She is uh, a classical percussionist, you know, and many famous um, modern to contemporary uh, composers have written pieces for her. And I saw her when I was in the Oxford um, uh, music therapy um, conference. She did the opening concert and I didn't know anything about her. And I was so astonished about the quality of music which they did. She, she really teaches you to listen. So when you want to have a, a lesson in listening, listen to a deaf woman. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye.